I am so very excited to be here with you today and discussing how to build a leadership development program. And again, thank you for allowing me to join you on your professional development journey. You know, as the slide says, having strong leadership is key to organizational success. And you know, I've been in the EMS field for a long time and I've worked my way up from being a paramedic to a field trainer, to a clinical educator, to a clinical director, and then finally as an EMS chief. And I am the definition of what the problem is in EMS when it comes to promoting leaders. I was a great worker. And when I was given a promotion into having leadership responsibilities, I was a total failure. I didn't inspire anybody. I didn't know how to motivate people. I had an ego the size of Texas. I felt like the workforce was here for me and not the other way around. And all this worked out for me to be a poor leader. I was a, a horrible leader. And then something amazing happened. I began to learn the science of leadership. And like any other science, when you have the right combinations, you begin to see outstanding results. And for years, I've been saying that leadership is both an art and a science. And you have to learn and understand the science before you can paint the portrait of organizational success. You know, one of the things that I've realized is that the lack of leadership development is not just an EMS issue, but in all, it's all around in all organizations. There's a lack of critical leadership skills and leadership training. And of course, there are some great courses out there in our field. And if you get a chance, go ahead and send some of your folks for that initial or continued training. You know, consider that. But that's very cost effective. It's not very cost effective. And sending every leader to an outside course gets costly and it takes a lot of time. Then when those leaders leave your organization, you're in the same boat of trying to get those new leaders retrained. And the answer is setting up a leadership development program that will allow you to prepare, train, and polish your leadership resources. And today, I want to spend some time with you to talk about the overall blueprint on planning, developing, and building your leadership development program. And I want to give you some science. I want to give you some philosophy. And then I want to go ahead and just kind of talk about the overall process of putting that program together. Here are your objectives. I'm not going to read them to you. You know, when we think of leaders at all levels, there are shared leadership challenges as well as, uni as unique challenges to every level, right? There, there's always a learning curve and speed bumps when jumping from one level to another. First, we start by leading ourselves as workers. Then we move into leading others as supervisors. Then as we move up the chain, we're leading leaders. And then finally, we get to the top where we have to lead our organization. And all of these le levels require enhanced skill, talents, and capabilities. And it's important that we ensure that we are getting there. The failure is not recognizing this unique focus. And when building a leadership growth program, you have to remember two things. And if you're taking notes, write these down. You have to develop general growth courses pertinent to everyone. And you've got to develop directed and focused instruction for each individual level. All right. So I want to talk about just a little bit of foundation before we get to the meat of this presentation. In the most basic sense, leadership is defined as the ability to influence. If you can influence somebody, you can lead someone. Leadership is a verb, an action. It's not a noun. Leadership is something we do, not something we earn. Of course, when you practice the science of leadership, you can call yourself a leader. But even more importantly, your workforce will call you the leader. So when you have a title or a position, this is what outlines your job resp responsibilities and not your ability to lead, okay? One of the questions that we ask our workforce, and, and, and let's go ahead, and I wanna go ahead on a side note, and for the purposes of this pre presentation, I wanna try to assist in developing a different mindset, okay? And one of the questions that we like to ask our workforce is, who our customer is, right? And we look for the answer, everybody we come in contact with. Well, I wanna ask you the question, 
Who are the leaders in our organization? Leadership is defined as influence, I just said it. And if we can influence people, we can lead them. And, and what do we want out of our leaders? We want them to be great communicators. We want them to be problem solvers. We want them to be critical thinkers. We want them to be dedicated. We want them to influence others. They need to be able to manage conflict. They need to be able to be self-motivated. And that's just to name a few. But what's funny is... We also want these traits out of the members of our workforce too, don't we? When we think about these leadership skills, members of your workforce are the leaders inside each and every organization. We need to stop thinking of them as labor and we need to start treating them as leaders. Okay, let me ask you this question. And, and I put this slide up there. You saw it pop up as I was, you know, standing on my soapbox. But when you think of leadership, what is your metric that outlines the measurement of true leadership effectiveness? What defines successful leaders? Our job as leaders is to get the mission done through other people. And it's our responsibility to get the very best out of the workforce. These are the individuals that we invited into our organization to help us to be successful. So we need this workforce more than they need us, especially, I mean, you know this, if you're in, a, in an area where you've got more than one EMS agency, they can go anywhere, right? So why are they picking you? We need to inspire. We need to motivate. We need to get our strategy for meeting the vision completed through these important members. And the only resource, this is the only resource we have inside our organization that will grow in value. Our ambulance, they depreciate. You know, our, our CAD system, it depreciates. But the members of our workforce is the only one that increases in value. And you can slice it and dice it any way you choose. But the true measurement of leadership success is how engaged, satisfied, and productive your workforce is. The Gallup organization will tell us that 29% of our workforce is engaged, 54% of our workforce is disengaged, and 17% of our workforce is actively disengaged. So let me ask you this question. If we need the workforce to be successful, and if we know that leadership success is measured on engagement, uh, satisfaction, and productivity as a workforce, how could we be successful as leaders with 75% or close to 75% of our workforce being either disengaged or actively disengaged. More importantly, how is our organization going to be successful? You know, this is just more proof of how important developing the leaders in our organization is for our organizational success. And when we think about the benefits of leadership development, the importance of having, you know, of, uh, you know, is vital for the overall success of the organization, right? When strong leaders are hitting on all pistons and working as a team, the engine of leadership provides a strong competitive business advantage. And some of the things that allows us to do is to enhance our financial performance. We need to be able to, to meet the bottom line, right? And this is by making sure that everybody has an invested, invested interest here. We need to be able to attract and retain talent, not just leaders, but our employees. And I'm going to say this now. Again, I'm going to jump off script here a little bit. And if we have a good retention of the workforce that we have, then we don't have a recruiting issue. But recruiting is a big problem within our career field. We need to be able to ensure that our leaders are driving strategy execution. I'm going to hit on this in the next few slides because this is really important. We need to be able to ensure that change is going to happen. And we need to be able to, to know that our leaders are able to facilitate this change. I was reading an article at a Stanford University that said the reason that people inside organizations don't like change is because a lack of confidence in their leaders. And that causes stress. And we already talked about controlling costs. And, you know, that's very important inside our organization as well. But there are some challenges, right? So the current leadership development challenges, we don't take our strategic goals into account when comparing that with the leadership gaps. And that's very important. And I'm going to talk about what that means here in a second. We need to be able to ensure that we develop or train our leaders to meet the needs of the workforce. And we don't develop members of the workforce to fill future position, uh, positions. And finally, our job descriptions 
or generic and not set on the organizational vision and strategic goals of the organization. So that's just a little bit of foundation. And I went through it fast, and now I'm going to slow down a little bit as we talk about step one. All these things that I kind of covered, we're going to kind of touch on again as we move through the rest of these slides. So step one, what's the first thing that we need to do? And this is going to be true foundation into how we're moving forward now. The, the, the sequence of, the, of development is first, we need to be able to ensure that the vision statement in our organization is the blueprint for organizational success. You know, I, I love to ask the question to leaders, how many of you have a vision statement in your organization? More importantly, uh, I'll then ask them, uh, who can come up here and recite it for me? And you wanna see hands go down really fast? And, and what's important here about vision is this is the most important document in the organization. As, as adults, as humans, we are wired to think in pictures. Anything that we think, you develop a mental picture of that. And I always give the expression, think about a car, think about a front door. You don't see the letters D-O-O-R, you actually picture a door. In the absence of a vision, we don't know where we're going, and we certainly don't know when we're gonna get there. So now when we start to think about organizational success, it has to be based on this vision. And I've been saying this for a long time. If you don't know your vision statement, if you take anything from this presentation, go to the book, rip it out, tear it up, get your workforce to the table, get the leaders to the table, and build a new vision that everybody can be part of. Next thing that we need to do is we need to develop goals to reach the vision. So this is what the strategic goals are. We want to be able to develop. We want to be able to be. Well, how are we going to do that? Once the vision is set, we now develop the goals to reach the vision. And then the third part in this sequence is we need to develop the plans to reach the goals. These are the step-by-step -step processes in how we're gonna do that. And the vision, the goals, and the plans, now what? Leaders, again, need to be responsible for getting the work done through other people. Leaders are tasked with getting the very best out of the workforce. But again, remember what you know Gallup says, almost 75% of our workforce is either disengaged or actively disengaged. So we need to be able to take our vision statement, we need to be able to take our, our goals, and we need to be able to develop that into the processes that our leaders need to follow, okay? So I wanna show you a vision statement. So this is a vision statement I had in one of my last operational roles and dedicated to achieving clinical excellence while driving outstanding patient care, being leaders in our community and role models for our career field. All right, that's a pretty straightforward vision. And I wanted everybody to learn this vision. I wanted everybody to be able to recite this vision. And I would go ahead and challenge the workforce when they would say, Chief, we need to bring this, you know, this program here. Well, how does that help us to achieve clinical excellence and delivering outstanding patient care? And I think that those are really great questions to be challenged. Everybody had a stake in this vision, right? So we had a clinical vision. We wanted to be excellent with outstanding patient care. We had a leadership component. We needed to be leaders in our community. And then we had expectations and accountability because we wanted to be role models in our career field. So when we think about goals to reach the vision... We needed to have clinical knowledge and skills, one. We needed to have leadership, stewardship, and operation management and understanding. And third was expectations and accountability. And when we think about this from a clinical standpoint, when we think about this from an operational standpoint, when we think about this from a fiduciary standpoint, a financial standpoint, these are now all going to go into the requirements of what our leaders need to know to help us to motivate the workforce to reach that vision. So now step two, okay? So now that we have a vision, now that we have our strategic goals, we need to be able to look at the process of how do we move this forward, right? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to be able to build job descriptions based on the skills that are needed to reach the vision to work the strategic goals to reach the vision. So a lot of times you see on, on all the, you know, the list serves and does anybody have a, a job description for this? Anybody have a job description for that? And we share those job descriptions. They become very generic 
each position should be set up with the same skills, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but based on the different levels of responsibility. And, and we'll, we'll hit that here in a second. And then finally, we need to be able to use leadership assessments to make the determination of where leaders sit on that skill level of where they need to be able to grow from to complete that job. I mean, so if we think about this, you know, just basically, if we talk about that someone needs to be able to be a good communicator, do they need to have presentation skills at the supervisor level? Well, maybe, but we need to be able to list what is their components from, from a, a zero to a five and where they fall on that zero to a five in that specific skill. And then we have to polish and grow that skill before they jump into the next you know, level of their career from supervisor to manager. Then that communication skill changes. And then they need to be able to develop that communication skill based on that management position or that manager position. So now that we have the understanding of where we need to go, how do we specifically help the leaders in our organization to develop? So I want to be able to take you through this process. First, we identify the goals, right? We know what the vision is. You know, we want to achieve clinical excellence. We want to be leaders in our community. We want to be role models for our career field. So we know that all the things that we need to be able, all the skills that we need to be able to come up with to reach the goals, to reach the vision is there, right? So we're going to talk about it here in a minute. What do we need? So we need to identify those goals. The next thing we do is we assess the proficiency of the people who are doing the work at their particular level. So where are they? What, what, what skills do they need to have at their specific job responsibility? Communication, conflict resolution, problem solving. And then at what level do they need to know those things? So do we need them to get to a point of being able to manage conflict across several departments. Well, that's probably a director or, or a director position, right? Because now you're running departments. You're not necessarily running just one, one department. So we have to be able to assess their proficiency within the specific skill level they're in. And then what's really important and what we forget is we need to be able to determine the learning styles of the individuals that we want to grow. A lot of times we have the tendency of teaching how we learn best, but we know that there are auditory learners, there are visual learners, there are tactile learners. And if we're building a leadership development program and we don't put our leaders into a learning style, we're teaching them how we learn, we may be doing a, a, a disservice to them. Next, what we wanna be able to do is create a personal improvement plan. Once we determine the skill they need to have, once they determine their proficiency within that skill, then we know how we need to grow them. From there, we need to be able to develop the step-by-step -step plan of how we get them from their point A to their point B. You know, we need to be able to then complete the desired training. I'm going to give you some tips here in a few minutes of how we can deliver this training. And then finally, another failure here is that we need to be able to continue to evaluate their performance within their specific skill level and then assess the progress of having them move up that level. So again, if we talk about conflict resolution and we know that under the supervisor, we're going to grade them to a five, five is going to be the top of what they need to learn for that conflict resolution skill. Once we get to a five, we need to be able to still grow them. Or if there are three, how do we get them to the next level of four? And then so on and so forth. So just for some, um, I guess some from foundation, if we think about our supervisors, we need to be able to think about them in the standpoint of managing themselves and managing others. So some of the skills that they need to have is accountability. They've got to be accountable to, accountable to their self. They got to be accountability to their workforce. They got to be accountable to their peers. They got to be accountability to the level of leadership above them. They need to be able to have good conflict management skills. They need to be able to know how to coach and develop others. Of course, they need good operational management, and then they need to know how to leverage diversity. So when we think about this from the standpoint of a supervisor, 
you know, everything that we are doing within our daily responsibilities will fall into one of these five categories. You know, accountability. We need to make sure that we're meeting the operational goal of being on scene on a priority one call in eight minutes and 59 seconds. Well, what skills do they need to have to manage that accountability? When we think about conflict management and we think about our workforce, what do they need to have for conflict management? Again, do they need to manage conflict over different departments in the organization? It's it's cab justice, right? How many times has somebody come into your office to say, I just can't work with this partner anymore? Have we given them the skills to help them manage that conflict within that ambulance? Have we given them the skills to help them to help them manage that conflict on scene when they're having you know a, a, a conflict or a horrible interaction with a patient or family? But again, from the supervisor standpoint, what do they need to know for conflict management? It's different than what the workforce needs to know. Similarly, as we move up the chain, manager, director, chief, they have a, a different uh, level or a different uh, need for their conflict management. Okay, so let's put this in a nutshell. We put this kind of in a in a proficiency evaluation cycle or evolution cycle. We determine the skill that's needed, whatever it is, conflict resolution, communication skills, accountability. We test their knowledge and their mastery. Again, once we put them on the scale of what they need to know for being a supervisor, for being a manager, how are they meeting that goal? Remember, when we talk about conflict resolution, they, they have to know this to be proficient in their skill, but they're not going to have that pr level of proficiency unless we help them to get there. So where are they on that scale of a one to five? And then our job is to get them. If there are three, we got to get them to a five. So now they're mastering that capability of the conflict resolution skill they need to know at their specific level. Again, determine their learning style, which is very important. We want to be able to keep them inspired. We want to be able to keep them motivated. So we need to be able to teach them how they're going to learn best. Create a performance improvement plan. Retest their ability and mastery and document it. You know, when I was in the Air Force... They used to, I used to have a training record, right? And I had to go, when you graduate from your tech school, you're an apprentice. And then you need to be able to go to a journeyman or a technician. Then you go to a supervisor. Then you go to a manager. Well, all those levels have a training component. So under each training component, I had a competency that I had to be able to achieve to get from apprentice to technician, to get from technician to supervisor. So if we know that accountability, if we know that conflict management, if we know that operation management and the skills we need to have under all those um, headings, they need to be able to start. When did I start learning this skill? Okay, today's October 27th. I started my conflict management, and these are the skills that I did. When you finish that, that proficiency, that capability, you sign it off. And then you know that they've completed that level of training. Okay. And then you want to continually assess the new development. Now that I'm proficient in my level five conflict resolution, what do I learn next? Well, determine if there's another skill that they need to know, and then start this process all over again. All right, let's go ahead and go to step three. So when we think about the vision, when we think about the strategic goals, when we think about plans to reach the goals, everybody in the organization needs to have the same skills. All leaders need the same skills, but it's the degree of the skill development that's based on their position. We know that there's a difference of degrees. You know, knowledge is going to differ. And then, uh, you know, based on being a worker, based on being a supervisor, based on being a manager, a director, so forth. And this is where leadership assessments come in. You know, there, there are a lot of great leadership assessments out there. You know, DISC is one that I use and I'm really, really... Um, I really, really like it because it really, really, it, it outlines where the, you know, the leader is starting from, and then it gives me a good path of developing that performance improvement plan to get them to the next level. And if from a organizational standpoint, this is, this is the way that it needs to, you know, play out. This is the leadership development pyramid. We want to have core competencies. 
Then we need to be able to have leadership competencies. And then we move that up the chain to professional competencies. So you can see at the bottom, they have the core competencies uh, for everybody, right? Integrity, honesty, interpersonal skills, flexibility, you know, oral and written skills. We kind of talked about that. And, you know, then you look from the team leader and the project manager, you know, look what they have. They have team building, customer service, uh, technical credibility, so on and so forth. Then that purple moves all the way over, meaning that the supervisor and manager needs to have all those skills. Similarly, when we go to the supervisor, human resource management, levering, di leveraging diversity and so on, then that plays out down the line as well. So everybody in the organization has the core competencies, again, based on their level of um, responsibility. You know, communication skills at the team leader at the workforce level is different than at the manager level. So we have to be able to define those as well. Let's go ahead and look at it per position because I've, I've kind of used that as an example, right? So for conflict resolution, for conflict resolution, uh, the capability level is for the emerging leader. These are members of our workforce, right? We need to, they need to be able to ensure that they have some type of tool to help them in delivering, you know, in dealing with difficult situations. It may be with their partner. It may be with uh, a member of the healthcare field. It may be with uh, officers or, or first responders. And this, they require frequent guidance here. How many times have they come to you and said, I got a problem with my partner? And you've said, well, have you talked to your partner about it? Well, no. Well, let me go ahead and tell you how to how to do that. Let me give you some tips on how to do that. If it doesn't work, go ahead and come back to me and we'll and we'll talk about it again, right? So we're giving them frequent guidance. So they need to be able to share their thoughts. They need to be able to share their feelings. More importantly, we've got to teach them to listen to the other side. One of the biggest things that I've found in my career is that when you deal with workforce issues, a lot of times it comes down to communication issues and they're not listening. Sometimes they're saying the exact same thing, but they're saying it differently. And then we need to be able to give them the critical thinking and the problem solving that they're able to develop compromise. Sometimes we're not going to be able to fix the issue, but we have to be able to compromise. If we think about the supervisor level, they need to be able to know when they're in a difficult situation. Now they may need guidance, right? It, they may have been able to deal with somebody when they're giving uh, corrective action. So they're comfortable with doing it. One of the questions I would ask supervisors all the time is, you're gonna have to terminate this employee or you're gonna have to give this employee a, a written action. Are you comfortable with that? How are you going to handle that? If they were comfortable, I'd give them the opportunity to do it. They've got to be able to address employee concerns take action as needed, and use mediation now to manage disagreements. As we go up the level, we go to manager, and I'm not going to go ahead and read all these to you, but as we start to climb up this process of how we're moving up the chain, our level of uh, you know, capability of handling conflict resolution changes. We're, we're growing on our experience at the lower levels as we get up to that next level level. One of the things that we do, I think, as a disservice is as we promote from supervisor to manager, as manager to director, we, we, we have to be able to grow the skills necessary to move into those positions. Once you've mastered the skills at the supervisor level and you've signed off your competency that you've you know attained mastery at that level, you've now got to be able to move to the next level. You may still be in the manager position, but let's start working on the director capabilities. Certainly, here's your senior leaders. When we think about our senior leaders, what do they need to know when it comes to conflict resolution? So how do we deliver education? Tons and tons of printed articles and web articles and business journals that are out there. I mean, we invest in some of these journals. Uh, for $100, you can, address, you can uh, get yourself a subscription to the Harvard Business Journal. And, uh, you know, it's a great way to talk about the latest leadership trends that are happening. And then you're able to kind of build things that are around that. When we think about YouTube videos, I mean, you know, some great 
you know, speakers out there have free content. John Maxwell, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, um, you know, just name them, you know, Simon Sinek. I mean, there are just so many great leaders out there that we can take a YouTube video, put it on our intranet site, send the link in the email, and then say, I want everybody to kind of, you know, watch this and then let's talk about this. Tons of webinars. Look at what you're doing here is, is you're learning this, you know, how to develop this program and certainly guest speakers in the day of pandemic. We're not able to get around like we used to, but we're doing a lot of guest speaking via, uh, webinars, via virtual webinars. It's a great way to do it. Then you, you're the leader. You're, you're what they aspire to be. So Take time with your leaders, have a monthly round table and, and have a topic and then talk about the topic, give them a scenario and let them learn from your experience. And this is something that could be done at any, at every level. And if you're doing those things for your leadership team, record them. So the workforce can hear that lesson as well. Remember, they're leaders too. And those are things that we need to be able to think about. And then finally, give them tasks or projects to complete at the level that you want them to learn from. And it may be something that's above their skill level. You know, from a supervisor standpoint, I used to give them the ability to run the um, shift bid. Right. That should that should have been my job to get all the shift bid, you know, information to kind of rank the employees where they needed to be and then put them into the positions where they needed to be. Well, that was a higher skill, but the supervisors were able to do that skill based on giving them the opportunity to learn that when they get to the higher level. Now I'm gone from that organization. They're still doing shift bids. Uh, and it's because we gave them the opportunity to do one. This is the old see one, do one, teach one mentality. We want to be able to let them see how to develop this skill or how to deal with this process. Let them do it. And now they're teaching somebody else to do it. I'm a big fan of doing 360 degree evaluations. We give our workforce evaluations on how they do their job. It's only fair that they evaluate their leaders and how they're doing their job. Those are the people who are engaging them. Those are the people who are trying to inspire them. Then from those 360 degree evaluations, we really can measure how is the growth of that leader doing at that particular time in those particular skills. If the workforce is saying they're not being very inspirational, they're not being very motivating, they have poor communication skills. I mean, that's the real time feedback that these leaders need to say, I got to polish these skills. I, I got to work within this skill. So who are our leaders? Everybody in our organization. We need to think about our emerging leaders. They are members of our workforce. How do we develop the critical skills they need to be successful? We have our frontline supervisors. These are the leaders that guide the workforce. We have our middle managers. Those are the leaders that lead programs and they lead the other leaders, right? Whether they're clinical supervisors, whether they're operational supervisors, whether they're dispatchers. Then we have senior leaders and they lead mul multiple departments and again, executive leaders. So we know who they are, but they, one of the things that I put this slide here, I say, Chris, we've already covered this, right? But I want to talk about this from the process of leadership for all. We need to be able to have a continual learning process for every single level in the organization. They, we need to be able to develop a process where customer service, client service, patient service is talked about. Every single level in the organization needs to know that. We think about flexibility. Oh my goodness. When change happens, people lose their minds. And we've got to be able to understand that flexibility is important because change is inevitable. We cannot have the same organization three months from now that we have today because a pandemic's going to happen, because Hurricane X is going to hit our, you know, hit our service area, because of whatever that is. And we need to be able to understand. We need to have good interpersonal skills integrity and honesty. And, and, you know, we just continue up this chain. What What's leadership for all? Oral communication. We need to be able to have good oral communication skills with or without presentation skills, critical thinking and problem solving skills. Again, these are all, you know, these are all skills that every single level needs to have. You know, we're in the public service and we are, you know, in the public's eye every day. How do we motivate the public? We always talk about that the public doesn't know what they do. They don't know what EMS does. 
Well, how do we how do we give them that education? How do we help them to understand that? And I love resilience. I don't know that resilience is really hit on a lot. Things are going to go wrong. And it's vital for the individuals to know how to bounce back from those things that are going on. One of the big things in EMS that we have to work on, and I think a lot of skills, is our writing skills. And we all need to know as we move from provider up the chain to senior leadership, the level of our writing needs to change. And uh, it gets more in-depth, it gets more technical, so on and so forth. Now, I do want to plug that uh, for a lot of years, um, you know, the National EMS Management Association, they, they did some really great work in developing the seven pillars of National EMS Officer Competency. And if you don't have these, you really need to be able to ensure that you put your hands on them because it really kind of gives you, as you see, the seven pillars, and it outlines them per position as well. So if you want to be able to use these pillars to grow your vision and goals, they're already there. And, and let me go ahead and go off script here a little bit. As leaders, we consider ourselves to be professional. And I hope we do anyway. And if we consider ourselves to be professional, we should be members of professional organizations. And the National EMS Management Association is there for the leaders in this field to ensure that they grow to the next level. And if you're not a member of NEMSMA, go ahead and just go to their website, talk to some of their members, but everybody should be part of this organization. From the workforce side, we have the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians, and we should encourage those professional providers to be part of that professional organization. Okay, that's off my soapbox. When we think about our manager development, these are some of the things that our managers need to know. And as we start to move up the chain, we think about creativity and innovation. Where, where does that fit into the skills for everybody? We all have to have creativity and innovation. We think about critical thinking skills and problem solving. Financial management, again, very important. How do we balance those budgets? How do we teach our workforce why we can't buy the new ambulances or the new pieces of equipment? Well, just because we send a $1,500 ambulance bill out the door doesn't mean we're getting $1,500 back. And let's go ahead and talk about that from that standpoint. We need to be able to partner with organizations. We need to be able to partner with, uh, you know, other um, agencies. Uh, we need to now deliver. We need to now be able to deliver some political savvy, have good strategic thinking and technology management. I got to tell you, man, technology management is a pain in the rear. I mean, when we think about putting in a new CAD system, when we think about bringing in a new electronic charting system, oh my gosh, there's so much to know. Well, those managers need to be versed in that uh, development. When we think about our senior leaders, when we think about the leaders at the top of the food chain, what skills do they need to know? What's well, kind of the same stuff, isn't it? Change management, just at a different level. Communication, and now they're giving presentations to the board of directors or the city council or, you know, whatever it is, the board of works, whatever you're calling your, you know, the next level of where that has to go for information. You know, you've got to have good team and relationship management. But it's, again, based on who you are. But it's important as all this comes down to delivering and developing good executive presence, just more on executive leadership. Some of the things that we need to talk about is developing constructive collaboration. You need to have a higher degree of emotional intelligence than any other positions, and you need to have great emphasis. You're the master Jedi of leadership. You're at the top. You're the master Yoda of your organization when it comes to leadership. You've got to be able to be the one who's setting the philosophy of that organization. And you need to be able to teach people that you're doing that. And then finally, your communication skills. It changes as you move up that line. So how does how do executive leaders grow? Well, what's the executive leader development look like? Who's teaching you those things? Well, from the executive side, find a mentor in your career field. But more importantly, find a mentor in your community. And we're going to talk about holding mastermind groups in your community, right? You're, you're the executive of your organization. Don't just look with inside your career field to find a mentor in leadership. Find a mentor in your community who's the same level as you that you can learn from. Of course, attend leadership development classes and conferences. Pinnacle's a great conference for leaders at every level. So you just don't have to be a senior leader to do it. 
And then finally, leadership is both an art and a science. And again, you're at the top of the food chain as a leader. You've got to be able to make certain that you're learning the science of leadership. Okay, well, I talked about mastermind groups. I just want to touch on that a little bit because, you know, this is this is really important for really the development of the senior leader, but it could be used really at any level. And I've been using mastermind groups for some time. And, you know, when we think about this, they've been around for a long time as well, this concept. Actually, Napoleon Hill, who's the author of Think and Grow Rich, you know, released that book in the 30s. But in his book, you know, the law of success that came out in 1925, where he was talking about getting together with like minded people. And we think about it, if we can invite people into our organization from the community, and just kind of talk about the challenges that are going on inside agencies, this isn't about teaching. This is really just about getting together with like minded individuals, you know, having the synergy and energy and the commitment and the excitement to participate in this group. And then, you know, you talk talk about the catalysts for growth. You talk about, you know, being the devil's advocate. You talk about support from colleagues, right? And, you know, one of the things that you you do is you throw a, you know, you throw a discussion, you throw a topic out on the table and just let the, let the uh, conversation go where it goes. Or you bring up, you know, I had some challenges in my organization this week. But anyway, this is a great plan. Uh, I love the mastermind groups and you should think about doing it. And, uh, you know, we think about mentorship and we think about growth from, you know, leaders within our community. It's also a great way to ingratiate yourself into the community as well. And I think that that's another great thing. All right. So we've covered a lot of things here. And I really just want to come to the end. So this is the long-term plan. I've given you a lot of things. So I want to go ahead and put this into a nice little bow for you. So the long-term plan, if we think about it, let's go ahead and reorganize our vision and strategic goals and you know, you know, develop a campaign around this vision. If you know your vision statement, if you've been working your vision statement, great. If not, this is a great time to tear it up and get the workforce to the table, get the leaders to the table, create one, two, or three different visions, send it out to the workforce for it to be voted on, you know, then and build a campaign around it, you know, remember the strategic goals and then post it everywhere. Let everybody know what the vision and the goals are of the organization. And then everyone needs to know their responsibility in reaching this goal or reaching the vision. And then, you know, the skills for the position over the next four months, use leadership assessments to determine where people are starting from. Rewrite the job descriptions to put the new skills that are needed to complete the goals to reach the vision. And then take that, uh, let that take you about four months to do that. And then finally, start the training and then start the leadership training and uh, let's go ahead and move forward. So that's a, that's a one year plan, but Hey, Chris, what, what am I going to do in the short term? Well, I think that that's a great question as well. Uh, well, let me just talk about this long-term plan, by the way, because there are people in your organization that you want to give projects to that you see the greatness in them before they see the greatness in themselves. And this may be a great project for one or two different people within your organization at any level to work on as a side project. So when you talk about being a mentor, when you talk about being a role model, how awesome would this be to give a program like this to somebody inside your organization that's looking for that break, that's looking for that opportunity? And sure, I think organizational vision and strategic goals have to be leadership, uh, you know, get some workforce in there. I mean, it'd be a great way for them to see what's going on inside the organization or inside the upper level of leadership. But I bet that there are people in your organization that could be the the champion for a program like this. Okay, let's go ahead. Well, what about the short term, Chris? Uh, that's a year. What, what do I do in the short term? One of the things that you can do is, you know, our, our workforce, and I took these from a, a couple different job descriptions on the internet, they already have responsibilities. They already have job descriptions of things that they need to get done, right? So in the short term, have your workforce, have your leaders look at their job descriptions and break down the responsibilities uh, into skills. So if they've got a right uh, and issue uh, verbal and written warnings as needed, what they probably need to know a little bit about constructive and corrective feedback. They probably need to know more about coaching. And by the way, when you're giving uh, corrective feedback or coaching to an employee, 
That's when they really need your leadership the most, by the way. All right, how about interacts efficiently, professionally, tactfully with the general public? They probably need communication skills, right? They probably need some uh, politics. This is a big emotional intelligence thing. And then finally, teaches continuing education based on the QA, QI process. Probably instructor methodology is a big one. CQI management and, of course, process improvement. One of the things to think about here is have the members of your leadership team take their job descriptions and then write the skills down that they're needed to complete the responsibilities, have them rate themselves on a one to five scale, and then that's going to be their starting point, and then deliver that continuing education, or even have them find the continuing education, and then have them write an article about it to go to their peers in the leadership team, or even more importantly, have them send it out to the workforce and let them um, let them see what's going on. So, all right. Oh, we covered a lot of stuff. Let's get into the final thoughts. Um, and the end of this, a great leadership development program needs awesome succession planning. We need to be able to know who the next level is going to be in our success. And that's at every level. Pick five or six or seven or 10 members of the workforce that you want to get ready to become operational supervisors. Who's going to handle the operation manager's position uh, from your supervisor pool and so on and so forth. Next, no one position is any more important in the organization. We all have different uh, responsibilities is, you know, I am the EMS chief. I have the overall responsibility, but we can't get the work done without the managers. We can't get work done without supervisors. We certainly can't get the work done without the workforce. And we need to be able to remember that. And then one more time, I want to hit it with you. Leadership is both an art and a science, and you've got to be able to understand the science before you can paint the portrait of organizational success. And I promise you, once you do that, uh, you're going to see a change in your organization. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you, it, it's been very exciting to be here today. And I've covered a lot of things and I hopefully I haven't making it too crazy for you. And I know I get to talk fast sometimes and maybe taking those notes. But what's really great is that this is going to be in the archive. But here's my contact information. If you need help outlining your program, uh, if you need help in any way, please feel free to reach out to me. And I think with that, I need to take a big drink. I need to take a big gulp of air. And I am going to get ready to take your questions. And hopefully there's some really great ones that, uh, that I can be inspirational and give some insight to.